Very good. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Wee. Look, uh, I, I can make some uh, uh, final remarks now, but I think we, we won't take a, a half hour or so for audience participation. If you have comments or questions, the floor is open. I must say I've been struck this morning by the way that we've heard, I think Kun Gawi mentioned the word security once, but aside from that, I didn't hear it used at all. And it seems to me there, there, are, two, there are two areas in which I have been very surprised in recent months, particularly that ASEAN seems to have been totally voiceless with, without any suggestions whatsoever in terms of its own better integration. One of these is counter-terrorism, which one doesn't need to really make any additional remarks on. We, we understand that this is something which has come to ASEAN, which is a reality which is going to get worse in the coming years. And the other is peacekeeping, international peacekeeping. And it seems to me that if you look at both these areas, um, there should be a great potential for ASEAN to come together as, as, a, as a regional body and actually do something which might initially be more uh, symbolic than substantive, but could grow into something substantive. And let's take counterterrorism first. It would seem logical after what we've seen in recent months around the world, but also in this region, that there is room for an ASEAN counterterrorism center which uh, would presumably attempt to better integrate the vast amounts of information reaching ASEAN's 10 member states in terms of the threats facing them. But clearly, we mentioned ASEAN has no enemies. Well, in terms of major world powers, that's correct. But putatively, the only real enemy ASEAN has is international terrorism. And one would imagine that there would be a lot of space to set up in whichever country um, is, is, is decided upon a counterterrorism center. Peacekeeping is another area where ASEAN, despite all its differences, one would imagine that it would be possible for ASEAN states to project the regional body as a center of peacekeeping excellence in conflicts around the globe. Obviously not within ASEAN's own geographic uh, area, but in terms of what's happening in, in, in Africa, in, in Latin America, wherever it could be, one would imagine that integrated military units drawing, trained together in, again, wherever it was decided, trained together and deployed together as ASEAN units, you would imagine there would be a lot of potential. It would presumably start off moderate, start off... Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess my question is primarily to Kun Jakrit and to um, Kun Gawi, and I'd, I'd be interested whether the political problems here are bigger than the ideas that I've articulated. Well, I will uh, answer the questions in two ways. The first with the peacekeeping. ASEAN has a long history in participating in peacekeeping operation individually. Actually, Myanmar is the first country in the early 60s that participate in peacekeeping. Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. But ASEAN has never fly an ASEAN flag. And I think, uh, Anthony, you, you, uh, you, you, you mentioned it right. And I think from now on, ASEAN is working to it toward this objective. Why? Because ASEAN, within ASEAN, Thailand and Indonesia strongly support that kind of uh, PKO under ASEAN. But we have not yet gained the consensus. But I think uh, this idea will, uh, because of the uh, increased engagement between ASEAN and UN. Uh, ASEAN and UN in the past year have developed very extensive uh, cooperation, particularly on issues of uh, peace and stability, post-conflict uh, situation, because uh, UN realized that uh, UN alone cannot do the job, so it wants to uh, give this job to regional organization. I think this will, uh, I cannot answer for uh, ASEAN member, but I think this is a positive uh, 
push for this. On counterterrorism, this is very strange because you have a country that have been affected seriously by uh, extremists, but country that have not yet affected by extremists. So the attitude reflects to these two basic uh, attitude. For example, country like uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, including Thailand, uh, to a lesser degree Cambodia, have a very associatic attitude towards counterterrorism, while the rest have not yet done so. I remember after the attack of the 9-11, uh, uh, ASEAN uh, got together for the first time, and ASEAN concluded the Treaty of uh, Counterterrorism in 2008. It was agreed in 2007 uh, because Philippines, Indonesia were champion of that treaty. It was complete in 90 days. So just for a record, that was good, but was not good. What was not good was it was not implemented fully. So at the latest meeting in KL, uh, ASEAN has to look back and say that, hey guys, let us implement this. Don't have to add something new, particularly on the exchange of intelligence, which has not done on the ASEAN-wide basis, but on individual basis. For example, Thailand and uh, um, Singapore has done very well, and uh, Thailand and of late, uh, of late in the case of uh, Air One bomb, with Indonesia, but it's on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis. And I think uh, what, Anthony, you will have in mind that ASEAN should act together. And I think ASEAN will, but this thing, there's still some uh, uh, difference of uh, perception of this threat, you know, like country like Laos or Vietnam. But I think slowly uh, they try to bridging the gap. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um... You know, on peacekeeping, this uh, issue uh, was actually raised uh, by Thailand uh, last year at the very first uh, ASEAN ministerial meeting. Um, uh, it had been raised before in ASEAN, but uh, still, as before, it did not. Um, uh, there was no consensus on, on the issue. Uh, there were concerns uh, over, you know, control over issues of sovereignty. You know, which are you know understandable, but probably not insurmountable. But um, at this point, and then and the commitments that it, this would entail. So, so there were uh, lengthy, quite lengthy discussions. And I expect that uh, for now, you know, it's uh, been put aside for the time being, but uh, it prob probably will resurface in the future. Uh, as for the point on counterterrorism, as Nkawi said, uh, yes, uh, there, there are efforts underway, and uh, Thailand expects to, to raise uh, this issue again. Um, on you know on information exchange, intelligence exchange, and so on. Uh, I think it's important to to implement what's been agreed on and to build on that. Um, and uh, I think this will also be be discussed uh, at the uh, upcoming uh, ASEAN US uh, summit. Thank you. It always seems to me as a concern that that when we consider models for regional integration, we look at the EU and exclude the African Union. Now, of course, the African Union, there's no equivalence in terms of size or GDP. African Union, 54 countries, more than 1.2 billion people. But at the same time, there's something that has been lost in translating the spirit of Bandung to, um, to, to, to ways of cooperating, you know, between Africa and Asia. Um, which, which I think needs to be realized, particularly because I think that there's some best practice, uh, um, practices within the AU that the ASEAN would do well to take note of. One of that is the, um, an instrument that is called the African Peer Review Mechanism, which is a monitoring uh, mechanism, a self-assessment instrument, through which uh, more than two-thirds of uh, 54 countries submit a report on how well 
they are doing um, around issues, all aspects of governance, um, democracy, the private sector, uh, human rights, etc. That's certainly something that um, that the Vazian can learn from. The second one is, of course, the, the point that Anthony just raised, well, it's a point around the fact that we have a integrated um, uh, uh, EU peacekeeping um, mission in place that has proven to be very effective to dwell, to deal with issues that, that comes up on the continent. And I, I seem to recall that when the ASEAN defense ministers met Malaysia, made a proposal to say that the ASEAN should consider and look at the example of the AU. Uh, peacekeeping force and how we've been able to to get that up and running and, and have that um, working so well. Um, I think that finally for me, um, you know, there's, there's been so many calls for a reform of the global economic system. Um, there's been calls for, for all kinds of reforms and now more than ever we need a coordinated approach. Um, we need to find ways in which we can co find ways of cooperating with each other. And I, I suppose that um, the time to translate that spirit into something more concrete has, has come. And since the Tinana has referred so amusingly to, you know, the EU um, embraces, um, the ASEAN hugs, I suppose the AU cuddles, and we invite you to be part of that. Thank you. <laughs> um, maybe on the, the AEC, since there's a bit of an emphasis there. Um, I mean, I was been looking, comparing the blueprints uh, between this new one, uh, which is now in effect, and the previous one. Uh, and I noticed a few things. Uh, one is uh, when they, they do include a, a section on a more people-oriented, people-centered, inclusive uh, AEC. Okay, So that's a, a good sign. And then the other thing that I noticed is they also include a section on sustainable economic development in the AEC, which is also a good sign. And if you look at the, the various different economic sectors in AEC, uh, you, you find references to environmental sustainability there. Okay? I mean, it's a start. All right? I think the, the, the litmus test would be, you know, we will have to monitor through the next 10 years of this blueprint to see how well those measures are taken up and implemented. Okay? And I agree very, uh, entirely that a good monitoring uh, uh, evaluation system is needed. Uh, and how to measure that uh, would be very critical. Uh, and I also noticed that uh, in the AEC, you know, all along the economic side, they are a little bit more progressive in the sense that on, the, on this non-interference principle where they have this so-called minus X principle. It's in the ASEAN Charter okay, for economic decisions. Uh, in other words, the minus X is meaning it doesn't have to be all 10 have to all go along. Yeah? As long as no objection, then you know, even five or three can go ahead, as long as the rest no objection. So maybe you know, in view of the emerging challenges and the need for speedier and expeditious uh, you know, a decision, uh, perhaps, well, of course, we, I do hope that the economic side will take the lead on this, yeah? uh, because they also stated it in their, in their section. Uh, and then finally, on the social cultural, uh, I think uh, I think DG uh, uh, uh should uh, take up this uh, because uh, there was uh, this ASEAN music festival at Benja City Park just about two weeks ago, and I was there twice. Uh, I think DG Jacket and others were there. I mean, here we have the bringing all the musicians and from all the ASEAN countries, uh, and then you know what's interesting is I noticed the crowd was been listening there. You know, the Laotians will come and cheer their Lao, you know, singer. The Cambodians will come, Myanmar and so forth, you know, and the Indonesians too. So I think music diplomacy, <laughs> I don't know if that's, if I can coin that, or if that's such a word, should be a little bit more widely promoted within the ASEAN social culture, and especially the low-hanging fruit. And it's also one of those that is uh, easily, you know, has very little controversies, huh? except that you know, if you start to claim which song belongs to who, then, then you get into a problem. But if you set that aside, then I think it could be a very good early harvest kind of uh, you know, initiative. Thank you. So we do a program, a media program called Reporting ASEAN. I wanted to connect some of the challenges in reporting ASEAN to some of the presentations made this morning. I think one of the difficulties we've had when inviting journalists to propose an ASEAN story is, what does ASEAN mean? 
And I think part of the challenge also is the public maybe is trying to find what is the dividend they find in ASEANization, if you call it, or ASEAN integration. So for example, in the presentation by Dr. Chandra, for example, when he was uh, describing like an increasing, a growing middle class, uh, the seventh largest economy and one day maybe more, um, how do you really attribute development or growth or improvement in quality of life of ASEAN citizens to the process of ASEAN integration? Because to me, often in that same description and many of the stories of journalists that we find, ASEAN is used as a, how do you say, it's a description mechanism. Often it's a geographic description mechanism. It is not a regional reference or a sense of belonging. I think that's the difficulty in selling the ASEAN idea. So I was curious, like from your part, um, how do you define that? How do you tell somebody because of ASEAN integration, this is what happened? It's very difficult for journalists to write about ASEAN as an entity because journalists lack the kind of information and understanding of this organization. This is one of the uh, problems. Actually, uh, most of the story written by journalists are bilateral issue between ASEAN and particularly member, for example, Thai journalists will write uh, Thai ASEAN relation. Seldom they write about as ASEAN as a regional organization. Now, I think more and more people are writing ASEAN economic uh, community as an entity, talking about uh, non-tariff barriers, talking about uh, regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership. So I think they have been changed, but these changes uh, are not fast enough to accelerate the sense of belonging, not like EU have a very strong sense. So I think uh, you need to educate the journalists to understand the dynamic of ASEAN. And I think in the case of Thailand, I'll give you one example. Uh, Thai journalists now are much, much better equipped with knowledge of ASEAN. Before that, say five or six years ago, uh, they were immune to anything about ASEAN. You know, The only news they have is that when ASEAN uh, holds a meeting here in Bangkok, and the first question is that, uh, sir, uh, why do you have this meeting? What Thailand get out of this? You know, it's a waste of money. You see, so now question is much more sophisticated, you know, uh, what law, what kinds of regulation Thailand need to amend to become a hub of ASEAN connectivity or tourism and all that thing. I think uh, journalists need to be educated. After all, ASEAN is not uh, sexy stuff. You, you cannot sex up these kind of issues, you know. It's all kinds of meeting. You have to understand document. You have to understand the nuances. But there is a, a good sign. I think uh, as the ASEAN community is here with us, uh, Thailand is very upbeat. I think Indonesia also, uh, Philippines, uh, Malaysia now start talking. And it takes a lot of uh, pushing from concerns, uh, uh, authorities, and also uh, from editors, because editors are not used to uh, news about ASEAN. And please, stop talking about ASEAN is moving toward EU. We are talking about apples, it's not about orange. ASEAN will never become EU. We'll never become EU, but we do steal good idea from EU. <laughs> but we do steal good idea from EU, but we never become. You know, after all, you know, if you want one good thing about ASEAN against EU, we always say that ASEAN has an ASEAN anthem, which EU has not. So that should be a, a good fact. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I may just add one point. Uh, it's always difficult to, you know, sort out the effects of a certain uh, regional organization from the effect of other uh, arrangements in place, for example, what, what are the net effects of ASEAN on, on trade, for example, because there are so many variables involved. But at least, you know, uh, in, within Southeast Asia, there's this um, spaghetti bowl or noodle bowl effect where you need to sort of detangle or uh, disentangle all the various strands of noodles. So, so I think w what ASEAN is trying to do is to add what value it can to the various ongoing processes already in place. And, and, and when they're not in place, to, to um, initiate new ones. Um, for example, in the area of connectivity, 
you know, uh, work in this area has been going on for a long time under the GMS framework with the support of the ADB and the MTGT, Bimpiaga, and so on. Uh, and now there are the various sub, uh, you know, the uh, Mekong subregion initiatives in, by various countries. Uh, so, so ASEAN is all part and parcel of this. You know, it's really hard to say where does ASEAN begin and the others leave off in terms of economic value. Uh, but I think overall, if there wasn't an ASEAN, we'd have to create one. And, and, and I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Thank you. Uh, I heard a lot about pub making public awareness and creating the sense of ASEAN mentality, but I couldn't see a tangible policy to create that other than ed education. Can you give some examples on how we can actually engage people in this sense of ASEAN community? One of the things uh, that we have seen in SARC is much more frustration than uh, what uh, I hear this morning. Uh, uh, we have two giants who have been fighting for several years for their border and that has completely halted uh, what we um, uh, imagined of SARC and um, that is South Asian Regional Cooperation for South Asia. So uh, now um, when we are talking about moving beyond 2015, uh, so uh, do you see any of the challenges like we faced in terms of uh, this disturbing relationship between countries uh, might arise and that might disturb uh, where we want to be or where the ASEAN wants to be in the future. Nancy Alexander with the Heiner Bull Foundation, Washington. Um, since the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, infrastructure competition has been heating up and um, the last speaker pointed out that uh, no one has been picking up on the infrastructure public-private partnerships and I just wondered if you could say a few more words about where the pressure for PPPs has been coming from and what the uh, political points of view are in the different ASEAN countries. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Michael from the United Nations. Um, I wanted to pick up on a, one of the points in the, the discussion from Kunkavi about uh, the role of civil society organizations. And I, I noted on the slide um, the indication that there are too many and essentially not focused. Um, I, I might respectfully disagree having worked with civil society in Southeast Asia for nearly 18 years. And I think that we've seen quite an evolution of the capacity of civil society organizations to be focused on uh, delivery and uh, concrete things that they can achieve. I also think that within the context of ASEAN, they've benefited uh, significantly with uh, communications, uh, LINE, WhatsApp, uh, Skype. People are able to communicate and they know what, what, what they're doing. Uh, I found it interesting that I, I understand what you mentioned about how ASEAN leaders have a difficulty in engaging with civil society uh, substantively. Uh, and I seem to think that may be a function of different member states relationships with civil society. I think our friends from Indonesia would uh, probably have a, a quite a different perspective than say others from Cambodia or Laos. So I'm wondering from the panelists, particularly from um, uh, Alex and Pai Ibrahim, thoughts about uh, the role of civil society moving forward as, as one of these connectors that can uh, help create this identity, ASEAN identity and contribute to strengthening the organization. <laughs> question on the uh, on CSO is very good how to strengthen so Indonesia has a, a really a crucial I think indispensable component of democratic progress comes from the civil society organization civil society movement going back to the transition and transformation after Suharto so how do we replicate that perhaps in other countries or uh, is that desirable and um, uh, what do you think about regionalization of uh, CSOs and then uh, we have a question on AIB, uh, a good one, and the PPP. Uh, anyone wants to address, uh, you know, what, is, what are the drivers for the PPP in, um, uh, in the context of AIB? And then the student question about how to engage, how to make concrete is uh, engaging people, people-centered, is, is it an empty rhetoric? Uh, in relation to that, uh, what's up ahead 2015 plus? Uh, do we see more tensions in, uh, in ASEAN? Uh, so we'll start down this way. Uh, Alex, you go first. Uh, okay, I, I think I'll just start with uh, uh, Michael's uh, question, which is, I think, uh, uh, quite 
uh, close to what I've been doing as well. On the CSO, uh, yes, I think you are right. By and large, I think the, there is uh, quite a significant uh, number of N uh, NGO CSOs, you know, in terms of numbers and volumes, and also the capacity are also expanding. But my own experience, I mean, I've been working also on with the NGOs uh, on economic side. I think this has been a quite key problem. Uh, uh, and, 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 and aside from a one or two organization, I think uh, there, there has been a lot of uh, uh, organization incapable of actually sitting down uh, with ASEAN and actually uh, 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 talking about uh, more technical technical uh, issues uh, on ASEAN economic com uh, integration. Uh, there, there could be two, two reasons for this. One is ideological. One is actually, you know, in favor of more liberal, uh, you know, economic liberalization, which is ASEAN. And a lot of the NGOs in the region are also very more uh, left-leaning uh, oriented. Uh, the second also is sim simple, uh, uh, you know, uh, technical, uh, because very, very uh, economical issue. So I think this has been, this has been uh, quite, quite difficult on the, economic, on the economic side. On the, uh, on the political security and the social cultural, I think that's different. I think uh, I know I know for a case that uh, where ASEAN has been making use of of of, of uh, civil society organization, uh, the role of uh, international organization like Oxfam, for example, uh, and also uh, other international organization in assisting ASEAN for uh, humanitarian disaster. Actually, in fact, they have a very close uh, uh, collaboration with uh, with with ASEAN Secretariat. So there has been a successful uh, context, but I don't think it has been the case with uh, uh, economic on uh, economic uh, uh, integration. Uh, uh, sorry, economic uh, sector. Uh, on the uh, challenges post 2015, uh, I would expect uh, I, I would expect less. Uh, no, I, I would I would want actually a less 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 a contradiction among ASEAN member states. But I think it's inevitable. As, especially, I think 20, 2016. I'm not sure whether even 2016 today this year. Uh, I, I'm just afraid that uh, what happened in Cambodia will be repeated again this uh, this year. You know, uh, hopefully not. You know, these uh, things uh, that can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, divide uh, ASEAN, especially because uh, you may recall that back in 2013, how ASEAN was un uh, unable to issue a joint communique uh, as a result of a pressure for, for, from certain countries. So uh, now it could, it could be another, but I hope uh, ASEAN will be able to, uh, to, to, to find a way to, to, to deal with this. And that's just one, uh, one point. This is not to mention about uh, other issues in economics. Now that the TPP is being, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership is being, being, being signed, and uh, four ASEAN member states are already part of it, uh, you know, to what extent that this will jeopardize not on, uh, well, not only regional ASEAN-led regional comprehensive economic partnership, which I believe should be the priority of any ASEAN member states, uh, and also, of course, the ASEAN own integration. So uh, I think this will be a key or contention point uh, for ASEAN post 2015, at least on the economic side. So. <clears throat> Uh, let me continue a bit about civil society cooperation in ASEAN. I think so far we have seen some uh, cooperation and some solidarity among CSO in ASEAN. Uh, with the case of the disappearance of uh, Sombat, Somporn, the uh, activists from Laos, I think ASEAN uh, CSO from many countries are also quite uh, solid in terms of uh, uh, they cooperating and they are uh, demanding the, the Laotian government to do more on that. And also, but the problem on CSO cooperation in ASEAN is that it depends on the country, the host country, when, when they host the, the ASEAN summit, uh, to what extent they incorporate civil society into uh, the process. I think uh, when, when, when Cambodia organized the uh, summit in 2012, CSO from ASEAN did not have any chance to, to gather, I mean, they were barred from from uh, organizing meeting in a hotel, and they need to use the primary school in the suburb of Phnom Penh to organize the meeting. But still, we, we can see the solidarity, solidarity, the cooperation, the high spirit of uh, CSO from ASEAN that they gather together. But when come 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 to Brunei, the CSO meeting tend to become uh, something else, like social work, social by uh, high-class people to give things to the people. That's why Indonesian CSO uh, did, not, did not attend uh, the civil society meeting in, in Brunei, uh, when Brunei hosts the ASEAN summit. But uh, anyhow, I think we, we have some hope. We have some hope on, on civil society cooperation in ASEAN. 
Another point I would like to, to, to make here is on the student questions on ASEAN mentality, ASEAN mentality. I think one of the major problems in ASEAN integration is on nationalist sentiment, nationalist sentiment among ASEAN member countries, which is still pretty strong, still pretty strong. Because most ASEAN countries, they have been uh, independent not long ago. The nation state building project has still been going on in the past uh, 50 years, 60 years. So nationalism is remain the case in, in ASEAN country. Therefore, I think uh, historical awareness, historical uh, perceptions, this is uh, the major problem in ASEAN. Because in the nation building process, you need nationalism. And to build up nationalism, you need some enemy. You need to protect some enemy. And in the case of ASEAN, the easy enemy would be neighboring countries. Neighboring countries. So we present each other as an enemy in our historical textbook. So this is, the, I think, the problem of ASEAN. That, that's why in, in ASEAN country, the competitive, competitions feeling is very strong rather than uh, corporations. When we think about ASEAN community, we think, oh, we have to compete more with Vietnam, we have to compete more with Indonesia. Uh, that kind of, of sentiment remain uh, prevalent in, in ASEAN. So ASEAN need to work on that. And that's why ASEAN social cultural community is very important. And it's the key to uh, deeper integration. Thank you. Thank you, um, Excellency. Thank you. Um, on the student's question about the ASEAN mentality, uh, I think um, there can never be enough policies to um, promote uh, an ASEAN mentality or a sense of identity. We've been trying, the government has been trying to organize various activities through outreach programs to students, to young people, to the outer lying uh, provinces. Uh, but it's a drop in the bucket. Um, I think that we, everyone, every sector needs to, you know, come up and organize this sort of activity. What's important is that um, we encourage youngsters to appreciate that uh, youngsters in other ASEAN countries are the same as us. You know, Dan uh, Bishai uh, referred to the ASEAN Music Festival, which was organized by my department. Um, this is an example of um, trying to get Thai students, the youngsters, to understand that you know they're just the same as us. You know, they dance with the same beats, they, you know, get up and scream at their favorite pop stars. And then there were Thai members in the audience. And I think they gave an, an appreciation that, you know, they were not all that different. And I think this sort of um, uh, gradual uh, uh, familiarization that will help form the basis for the uh, community of the future. Um, on the uh, tensions in the region, I think there will continue to be... Uh, uh, low, you know, um, uh, level tensions such as um, uh, haze, uh, which has been ongoing for over you know, a decade now, and uh, irregular migration may continue to be a problem as long as there uh, remains this, these disparities in economic development among the member countries. Um, but these will, I don't, I don't see the uh, possibility of this, these such uh, disputes or um, issues breaking out. Uh, into to, um, conflict. Um, as for the uh, CSOs, um, we have been also trying to outreach, reach out to the CSOs and uh, learn how they work, and they've been learning how we work. I think there's, we started out, you know, with um, a sort of um, uh, maybe um, negative views of one another, um, unfairly or unfairly. But as we work together, I think we'll come to appreciate as well that, you know, they have their uh, limitations and the, their potentials, and we can find a common area where, where, where we can work together. This is just the start of the ASEAN community, and I think that uh, there's a bright future ahead for CSOs and uh, states to, to work together. Thank you. Yeah, so on the regional CSOs, I would just say well, one thing from experience. We had the APF here in 2009. Uh, you know, it's vibrant. The, the regional CSO is vibrant. The only drawback I see is that they tend to be the same activists. So they need to broaden it a little bit. Uh, we? Given the time limit, I will pick on two issues on the PPP. The reason is the lack of funding and also lack of clear regulations. And also, um, I think this is uh, a big problem within ASEAN because big infrastructure projects preference were given to the, their own countries, big companies like Thailand, Philippines, uh, 
Malaysia. So I think uh, ASEAN uh, leaders need to be much more open mind. That is why the establishment of AIIB was so much attractive. And in fact, Malaysia has already signed the MOU with one project uh, with China in November last year. Now on the civil society, don't get me wrong, I really support CSO, but CSO has to learn. I remember in 2005, I engaged in all this, uh, CSO come out with the uh, outrageous idea that ASEAN should be ASEAN Union, and also cut off uh, the fourth uh, pillar, the environment, that sort of things, you know. But now they uh, have uh, changed their attitude, working on the things that are workable. But this is uh, one uh, technique. Uh, you look at Thailand, Indonesia, uh, they are much more successful in uh, uh, putting the CSO input in ASEAN's uh, uh, related matter. They work on the, their own officer first. ASEAN-based regional approach is very difficult, and it takes a lot of time. So for example, I give you one very clear example on human rights things, uh, ASEAN. Uh, Dr. Titinan mentions about the uh, ASEAN People Forum. He was the one who chairs the meeting. It was the most vibrant. Actually, it's the most vibrant, so vibrant that Cambodia got scared. You see, that's the start of all that. Why you have uh, NGOs selected their own people. Uh, Hun Sen said, I want to select my own Guangzhou, you know, to participate. So I think the most effective NGO organization, Indonesia, Thailand, because they lobby the officer in ASEAN, in the related ministry, to get really their input and add into agenda. You cannot, as a region, but it's very difficult. I, I try to think of one successful region by NGO, you know, thought like, for example, uh, on migrations, on uh, women's and child protection, I still need to look through the document. But I think NGO need to strategize among themselves. It's too many, uh, not really focused, and you have to work with the officer in your country to build up a case so that it's uh, go through the proper uh, procedures and raise in the discussion, and then become a policy, that I would say. Thank you. Uh, unlike most other public forums we've had at ISIS Thailand. This forum, we actually have the answer to the question. Uh, the ASEAN community is here, uh, now what? And the answer is now more of the same. Uh, we have the conclusion that, you know, now today, this month, is not any different than last December or last year, uh, because ASEAN is an ongoing process, is a work in, in progress. I would say this, we have some students here, this would be a good essay question. If ASEAN does not exist today, what would happen to Southeast Asian countries? So I've made a few notes. First, they would get picked off by the major powers. You know, China would come after Cambodia, Laos, maybe Thailand, and the uh, United States would come after, of course, Singapore, Philippines, they already have, Indonesia and Vietnam. There would be more major powers interference in the region there would be more tension among the major powers. There would be more human rights violations in Southeast Asia. There might be more conflict between the states of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian countries, such as Thailand and Cambodia, such as Cambodia and Vietnam, such as Malaysia and Singapore. And probably there would be less democracy in Southeast Asia without ASEAN. So that's one way to think of it. You know, it's a good thing that it exists, but it gives us many headaches and frustrations. It's a, it's a process. It's, it's more about the process than the result. ASEAN fundamentally is not about the destination, it's about the journey. So please uh, join me in thanking the speakers who share their insights, expertise, and time with us, and thank you for coming. Um, we have more activities coming up next Wednesday. We have something on the Mekong, the development of the Mekong dams uh, around a book launch. Thank you very much for joining us today.